This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great introduction. Um, I wanted to put joys, sorrows, and surprises. I wanted to put the human side to it because uh, we all know a lot of you are starting your careers and you have a lot of sorrows, you have lots of surprises, but it's a joyful journey to go through. So please, we find it and we find that it's all worthwhile and it's been very interesting and intriguing to work with peanuts. Um, we started working with peanuts. Well, I work in Embrapa, which is the uh, Brazilian corporation that is for agriculture development. Um, and uh, working with peanuts, when we started 15 years ago, there was very little known about peanuts. While it's very little, there's a lot of connections, but not much known about it. There were six a grand total of six microsatellite markers for peanuts. And uh, the mere act of extracting DNA was a stumbling block. And until we found a very nice protocol, which is Doyle and Doyle. <laughs> so, you know, we knew Jeff Doyle before we knew him personally. So being here, giving a seminar invited by him, by the Doyle, you know, it's, it's a great, great pleasure and honor. So thank you very much, Jeff. So what I wanted to do was, you know, I, I think peanut is not very well known in a number of places, although the US is very important in the US. So I really wanted to give a sort of good background on what peanut is like, what the wild species are like, and why we work with wild species, and uh, some of the interesting findings we've had in the last couple of years right at the end. So starting with peanut, I think most of you, I think it's a good international community here, but for the American ones, you know, United States is a very big producer of peanut and also a very big um, user. I mean, a, a lot of you have had these in your school years, peanut butter jelly sandwich. If you're more from the South, you may be familiar with these, which is great, ball peanuts, love them. So. It's a very important crop in the US. Although the US only produces 6%, a lot of the production is here in China and in India. Um, most of it stays there. A lot of it is used for oil or just eaten or for, um, crop for cattle. But Africa is one of our passions, is a place where peanut is really important in terms of staple food is where you know, women are more involved in the production. They actually, the women and the children plant the peanut a lot of the time, they harvest it, and is a source of income for the families where a society is more or less male dominated, is a source of a little bit of freedom and um, that the women have. And uh, they, I'd like to show these. Plumpy nut is something that is used. It's, it's, it was created originally by a French pediatrician. And I love that because that's uh, like in a packet food f that is used for combating malnourishment for children. So there has been some campaigns and you know, we have children which are, who are beyond hope and they, they get a lot of perking up using plumpy nut or related products. So it's something that is really important in Africa. And this is just a curiosity. In Kenya, in a small supermarket, you get more peanut products than I've ever seen anywhere else in the world. I think it's just amazing the way they use it. And it's so important in Africa. And I think the first written record that, that I've seen, that you know, we looked at, was by Gonzalo Hernández de Oviedo Valdez. He's, he was um, a Spanish writer. He wrote chronicles in the times of the great um, um, navigations. And then these was found in the Hispaniolas, the, in, in the Caribbeans. So, you know, think about the context of the time, the 1500s. So money, which is peanut, is very common with the Indians, with the native Indians. Christians take a little comfort in them and people be eaten mostly by lowly men and boys, slaves, and by people who do not pardon the taste for anything. So it really wasn't very appreciated like it is nowadays, but it's interesting the way he sees the way it's eaten by the native people. 
about 200 years later, it was um, you know, just called Arrakis Hypogea because of the way the fruit bears in the, f in the soil, by Linnaeus. And it became very popular in the US by George Washington Carver. He was a scientist, inventor, and he thought out 300 uses of peanut and is actually quite famous. And what his work, a lot of what we have nowadays in peanuts in the US is derived from, from his work. I'd like to know if you can hear me at the back. Can you hear? L louder? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just say if you can't hear. So Arrakis hypogea, it's, um, it belongs to the family of the Papillonidae, subfamily Papillonidae, and it's quite basal. It's here with the Stilozantis. Um, the, I think it's the genus that is more closely related to Arrakis. And uh, is the important um, feature of Arrakis is the subterranean fruit. So the flower, the ovary, the, the, the peg, after the, f the flower is pollinized, the, the peg um, grows into the soil and at the end of the peg, the fruit is developed. So this, because it's, it's self-pollinating, the fruit is under the soil, the, the uh, dispersion is very poor. So you have, in areas, you have populations that stay there for hundreds of years. So per year, you have dispersion of about one meter. So imagine to go one kilometer, you take a thousand years. So the dispersion is very poor, and a lot of the dispersion of Arrakis has been done by, by native people. So the center of diversity, unlike a lot of people think, so you think of Pena, you think Africa, because a lot of it made all its way to Africa in pre-Columbian times but the primary center is actually in South America. These region, the north of Argentina, south of Bolivia, and then these lines are um, migration lines. You can see anthropologies. This is a field work for anthropologists because these are migration lines of the native Amerindians. <laughs> the first um, archeological remains of something looking like a peanut were found in Peru about 8,000 years ago. And um, this is a very interesting civilization, the Moche, again in Peru. They are very interesting pottery. They, they were very well-developed um, uh, civilization. And they, if you Google Moche pottery, it's very, very interesting. So it's worthwhile. And among the lots of interesting pottery, some of them look like peanuts. And showing the importance of peanuts in their society. But more than that, I think it's really nice. Recently, they found remains of the Lord of Sipan. They were very rich. They traded in gold. They had very sophisticated uh, clothes, ornaments, and um, they had very interesting, um, um, well, probably religious traditions. So, Lord of Sipan was one of the most important persons. And look at his necklace, all made of gold. And so the si one side was gold, the other was silver. That shows the sun and the moon. So all into the peanut. So it's, it's been very important in South America for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. And it's still being used by native Brazilian Indians. Uh, this is Kaibi Indians in the reservation of Xingu. And they grow something looking like a land race and these peanuts here they do not fit into any of the six botanical varieties they're completely <coughs> different so you know it's being thought now that this area is one of the new um you know, one, one of the new centers of diversity so that's being established now so the origin is here in the north of uh, argentina and south of Bolivia, right at the verge of the Andes. And uh, one thing that is remarkable about, about it is that you know, for many years, researchers looked at what were the progenitors of peanut. And you well established now that Arrakis 
and the Rakis duranensis are the two most likely progenitors. And Arrakis duranensis, there are several um, accessions in this area. This is the area of occurrence. But Arrakis epiensis has only been found once. And after going back there, they never found this population anymore. So it's probably extinct in the wild. So in fact, we were very lucky to be able to have it. And uh, this is one of the joys of working with peanuts. We know what the progenitors are. And the closest related species to Arrakis epiensis, which is Arrakis magna, is found here, about 500 kilometers away, um, lower down. So it is very clear that there was um, the work of man in the creation, well, in the origin of peanut, because they were probably, these people were probably uh, growing these, um, these accessions, these plants in small gardens. And there was some pollinization and anyway, I'm going to show this in a minute. So peanut is an allotetraploid. So when you start thinking about genetics, you know, that's, that's what it is. And we have, we had some stumbling blocks along the way because of that. But anyway, the most likely progenitor is Arrakis duranensis, which is a diploid. It's called a genome because, you know, they have, there's a small chromosome, which is called the A chromosome, and the central meric bands, and the arachisipiensis. At some point, they crossed. There was this diploid hybrid, which was um, infertile. Through spontaneous replication, there was a tetraploidization and uh, created something arose that is similar to what we know peanut nowadays but obviously uh, through domestication. And we are very interested in what made the people at the time realize that this plant was tetraploid and was more interesting and, and it could actually give rise to something which is so different from the wild diploids. So as you can imagine, since peanut is a tetraploid and the wild species are diploids, that created a tremendous um, bottleneck so we cannot find, you cannot cross them. When you cross them, you get some infertile triploids, which are useless. So in nature, you have these diploid species, which are already quite separate. And then you have the peanut, which is tetraploid. So it's completely isolated from its wild relatives. So gene flow is irrelevant, is very limited. This is a very old slide, very, very old slide that we Know, from maybe 10 years ago, showing microsatellite markers in different, well, one marker, in different accessions, in different actually botanical varieties. And we found very, very little poly polymorphism. That's always been a problem for peanut, very little polymorphism. And accessions of the same species in wild, we find all sorts of polymorphism. So we, one of our missions and our roles in, in what we do is to bring wild alleles, to bring new traits, to, um, gen to help with genetics in peanuts and to increase resistances. This was a, again an old photo, again 10 years ago, of the first synthetic allotetraploid produced by a group. So you have the synthetic here and this was a spontaneous you know, fungus. A fungus sometimes in the greenhouse you have virus, you have fungus, you have all sorts. So peanut got completely fried, completely devastated with the fungus. And the synthetic was still happy alive. So that was, of course, we knew about resistances, but this was sort of something that came spontaneously in the greenhouse. And we kept this for posterity. So this is where the wild species are distributed in South America. So we can see a lot of river flows, ri river areas here, and we see also, when we look more closely, a lot of migration routes. Now I'd like to point out this one here. This is, a, is an isolated patch of Arrakis tenosperma, which is one of the most resistant plants, um, species of peanut. And we don't see, you can see that it's clearly taken by Indians. And 
we find this isolated population here, and we find other populations around other parts of Brazil. So in, there are many evidences of people carrying peanut seeds or araki seeds in South America. And araki is found in all sorts of environments, so it evolved with all, in all sorts of conditions. And there has been, there have been a lot of effort for collection, for um, understanding what the plants were like, or, and identification. And these are the three people who were alive. I mean, a lot of them are deceased now, but these are the three most important people who work with peanuts, who understand about wild species. Dr. Charles Simpson from Texas A&M, Guilherme Sejo from Argentina, and José Valls, who I'm a colleague with in Embrapa, Brazil. There are several banks, giant plasma banks, all over the place, but these are the most important ones. And um, I would like to point out that um, until the Convention of Biodiversity, exchange, germplasm exchange was much easier. So here in the USDA in America, I think there are about 70% of the species which have been um, identified. So at the time when people could go to Brazil, to Argentina, to you know, South America to collect, they would leave us a part there and bring some to the USDA and also transfer to other places, what other banks. After the conventions, this all became very difficult to, you know, to exchange. In Brazil and in Argentina, uh, national laws stop researchers from sending native materials abroad and make it actually quite difficult to work. It's quite difficult to work with native materials. If that has a, an amazing bank of cultivated species, of accessions. Um, he has the um, mandate to keep and to distribute. He has again some issues which are beyond the scope of this, of this talk, so it's very difficult to get material from Ikrizat too. But the USTA, I mean we've been having a lot of pleasure working with the USTA because they they have a very well organized bank, it's transparent, everything's online and it's very easy to, to get. So if you make a request to the USTA, you get a little packet of 20 seeds and they're very, very well organized and obliging. So, you know, it's, it's a very good bank and we, you know, it's going to be very important to keep it. And we've been trying to work with the USTA and convince funders and everything that it's important to keep it there. And the work we're doing producing new tetraploids, our, our objective is to have it all uh, deposited in the USDA, the work we do here in the US, so that it's available to the peanut community worldwide. So as expected, wild species have all sorts of resistance to pests and diseases. So these are the main pests and diseases of peanuts. Uh, somebody was asking me today, late leaf spot, root knot nematode, rust, um, aflatoxin, viruses, etc. So for all of these, some species have been found to be resistant. And in our work, and this is a work from starting some years back, we found that Arrakis magna, which is a bee genome species, was extremely resistant to rust. Well, actually, this is not Arrakis magna, this is peanut, but this is just showing what the rust is like. And Arrakis tenosperm is very, very resistant to um, nematode, amongst other things. Peanut not having a very good, easy genetics to work with, not being polymorphic enough, and not being very resistant at all, so let's work with diploids to bring in resistances. So how can we understand where the resistances are? So remembering that peanut has A and B genomes, so we decided to tease out the two genomes of peanut by using two different diploid populations. So we cross Arrakis ipaensis, which is the progenitor of peanut with the B genome species. Arrakis duranensis, the progenitor of the A, A part of subgenome with the A genome species with Arrakis tenosperma. And in parallel, we created populations for the A and for the B, B sides. 
created maps, phenotyped for not only these, but for all sorts of um, other traits, identified QTLs, created markers for resistance, linked to resistances, and we can use these markers now to do marker assist selection with PINET. But obviously, these plants are not very useful because they are in the diploid stage. So what we do in parallel to it is creating, building bridges, creating plants which are actually compatible and have harbor the other resistances. So what we do is we cross a wild species from a genome with a wild B genome species and artificially duplicate the genome. We use colchicine, there are all sorts of things you can use. And this synthetic plant now is now compatible with peanut, so we can use it directly with crosses. They are theoretically stable, not quite like that, but they, they're supposed to be quite stable, and we can use them freely. <coughs> this is what all the species which are theoretically crossable with peanut once tetraploidized. These are Arachisipiensis, which falls into the Arachis hypogea B genome clade. Arachis duranensis, that falls into the Arachis hypogea A genome clade. Uh, these were introns for different uh, genomes, the genome size. So these ones we designed are the ones that we have used in crosses and we have obtained successfully um, tetraploids. We've tried other combinations, but not everything is crossable. They're the prezygotic, they're all sorts of incompatibilities, which we have never studied very much, but we know they exist. So we try to select the ones that are closer to the, to the, B, to the genome of hypogea. But we have been able to get crosses from other more decent species. So we've done crosses in Brazil, we've done crosses here at UGA. Um, we are in collaboration with Tifton, we're in collaboration with Senegal, and we've created a number of plants which are compatible with peanut. And uh, we are doing back crosses here in the US, in Brazil, and also in Senegal. Um, these are the places where wild species are being used in breeding programs. The ones in yellow are the ones we are collaborating with. And I'd like to go into some specifics, some aspects which are very, we find very interesting, very surprising, very interesting to look at. When we duplicate the plants, when we get these two wild together, what happens to them? What happens in the genome? What happens, what does the plant look like? So a lot of you here are very familiar with with all this concept of nucleotypic effects, of um, you know, genomic merger, etc. So it's not going to be surprising for a lot of you, but for us it was fascinating. So we get a species which has a small leaf, cross with another one, and you get a duplicate, and you get a bigger leaf, much more similar to the tetraploid one. And that n doesn't happen only once, it happens in all the crosses. Uh, we look at the cell size in the leaf. So this is the guard cells here of the diploids. And look at the guard cells of the tetraploids. They're much larger. Epidermal cells as well. When we look at photosynthetic pigments, again, so the yellow ones are the diploids. Green ones are the synthetic tetraploids. And blue is peanut. So uh, what you can see is that once we tetraploidize the diploid, we get a much greater level of production of photosynthetic pigments. And then what would be the effect on drought? Because of course we've been involved in a number of projects that involve drought. And okay, so let's look at the wilds. They, a lot of them are grown in very dry environments. So we could try and find alleles from the wilds, right? Wrong. So we find it is not quite like that. Because, and then I'll show you why. So when we look at drought, how can you compare the drought of a plant, which is a peanut, which is a bushy plant, which has an architecture which is very particular, 
and compare with a plant which is scraggy, which has less branches, less leaves, and you know, how do you compare? Do you compare yield? Do you compare growth? Do you compare? So we had to tease it out a bit and find some traits which would be common to peanut and to the wild. And one of them was um, the transpiration rate. So we did this work in collaboration with Vincent Vadez, a colleague from, um, he's French, he works at Rikrizat, India. He's doing a lot of wonderful work with drought. So we looked at the transpiration rate on the stress. So this is, uh, one is 100, when you, the plant is in a pot 100% of water, which is in field capacity, and this is zero water. So the fraction of transpirable soil water is measured. And this is the measurement of the stress in the plant. So this is the normalized transpiration. So you have this stage in, in which you stop, you stop watering the plant of, or you water it in, in amounts that you know that the soil is getting dry gradually. And you observe the uh, transpiration of the plant compared to the controls. So what you're seeing really is tomato conductance, how this tomato is closing and how the plant is reacting to the drought. And this is called the threshold in which the plant stops, really slows down transpiration in response to the, the drought imposed. And um, well, the later the plant closes tomato and, and sort of defends itself against the drought, obviously you wilt more, the plant loses more water, but at the same time it's producing photosynthesis. So it's a trade-off between photosynthesis and uh, transpiration. So, yeah, so the threshold when it begins to de decline shows the water conservation of the plant. So we started looking at all the number of wild species and um, compared to the tetrapoid species. And we see that the diploids are much more conservative than a tetraploid. That's a tendency. We've done lots of tests. And we see that the diploids start closing stomata much earlier than the, their, than the peanuts and then the um, synthetics. Then we started looking at one combination of two diploids and the per and their synthetic. And what we see is that the parental diploids close the stomata earlier than the synthetic tetraploid. So we realize that there is a lot of changes in the plant once it's tetraploidized. That's one of the changes. So we cannot infer what the plant, what type of drought tolerance the plant's going to have according to the diploid. You have to go through the whole process of tetraploidizing first and then you assess the plants, then you look at what, what they're like. So this is another one of the for us at the time, surprise of this tetraploidy. And the other surprise was um, the seed. So everything grows, the leaves are bigger, the plant is bigger, you know, produces more pigments, it produces more, you know, this and the other. So, and the focus of peanut is the seed. So great, we duplicate the plant and we're gonna have bigger seeds, right? Wrong. So <laughs> that's one of our sorrows. Oh dear, you know, why not? Why can't we have the bigger seed? Um, and again, there's not one cross, one combination, all sorts of combinations, we see the same thing. This is a diploid, this is the synthetic tetraploid, this is the Rackus monticula, which is an undomesticated form of peanut, is one of the only tetraploid species which are wild. And these are peanut, peanuts, different peanut varieties of different seed size. So we see that it's consistent. The length, the width, the weight, it's, you know, we don't see much change. So we've, we had some discussions about it. We haven't figured out why, uh, but that's one of the things that we've, we've been um, finding. Well, the good thing about it is once we cross this plant, which is a tetraploid compatible with peanut, we get an F2 population which with a lot of segregation. So it's not all bad. 
you know, after a few rounds of selection, we find we can get recover, you know, plants which are, you know, have good resistance and also have good seed size, even larger than the original recurrent parent. So it's not all bad. We we managed to overcome that quite quite easily. So we looked at over 30 traits and we find consistent changes with tetraploidy. So what happens in the genome structure? Now once we look, well, the plant changes, so what happens in the genome? So I'd like to point out that after a lot of work trying to find markers, as far as I know, 10 tetraploid maps have been created so far. The top ones are the ones our group is involved with, and these are later on. And all of them, they follow the assumption that peanut is, a, is an allotetraploid with disomid recombination. So all of these use this classic allotetraploid model in which you have the A genome, let's say, and the B genome, and the recombination happens independently. So you have recombination the A side and recombination the B side. And what we found, well, this is, is a work we've done recently. We, we had l data sets from different maps and we found that some markers behaved not the way we expected it to. So it doesn't really follow the, the SOMIC uh, model. And we looked at these markers and we thought, these are markers that don't work very well, they haven't amplified very well, or the DNA is not working. And a lot of it we just ignore. So a lot of what we do when we don't have an explanation, we just have to ignore and move on. Otherwise, we stay on forever in the same problem. So a lot of the markers we just pushed under the carpet, which is ignored. This is one example of, um, of a step marker. So if we are, we are evaluating the A side, we expect only three groups. S you know, look at the A side, we expect just AA, AC, or CC. Okay, look at the A side, AC, you see AA, AC, or CC, not more than that. Often, we found some markers which some, you know, are not supposed to be there. Well, why do you have this group here? And we can only explain with this model. So we probably are having recombination between the A and the B genomes. And these we found consistently. Once we, we sort of click, that was about two years ago, about two years ago. Actually, we were in PAG and I saw uh, a talk on potato, and I thought, hang on, there's something here that maybe we are missing. So we looked back at all our data, microsatellite data, SNP data, and also s expression analysis data. And you know, we found that these strange markers, they were grouping into similar positions in the chromosomes, the leakage groups. So what we find here, the green parts are areas where we have tetrasomic for A genome. So we have a higher dosage of the A and nullisomic for the B. And the red is tetrasomic for B and nullisomic for A. So we, we started looking at this data. And this is a cross between a peanut variety and a synthetic allotetraploid. So we could easily establish that no, this is a segmental allotetraploid. So we, at the time, was, you know, sequencing the genome the, of Epiens and Duranensis, is tetrasomic recombination a big problem? Is it a big issue? Is it a small issue? How do we deal with it? How are we going to create, what are the new models we're going to use? We still haven't answered that, but what new models are we going to use to start mapping uh, peanuts now. How, are we gonna, how is that going to affect our breeding programs? How are we going to affect selection? So the first peanut genome, which is not actually peanut, but is the peanut progenitors, have been s recently sequenced. Um, versions of it have been available since 2004. And is a multinational initiative. 
And um, because peanut is allotetraploid, the two subgenomes are so similar, um, we decided as a group to sequence the two progenitors, Arrakis ipaensis and Arrakis duranensis. And that's, um, as I said, has been um, deposited in peanut base. It's, it's been freely available for almost two years now. And um, it's being curated by the group of Steve Cannon from Iowa State. And, uh, you know, that's being a very good source of um, information for, for the whole peanut community. So we decided, you know, now we can start answering some of these questions with the, with the genome. So we know that the crosses that involve wild species have a good degree of tetrasomic recombination. But how much of that actually happens or affect peanut genetics? Because once you have wilds, you may have you know, more wild things going on. But how about peanut itself? So we did some short read Illumina sequence, so some skin sequencing from several peanut genotypes. Then we mapped those sequences. Of course, we're going to have a mix of A and B subgenome. So we mapped them onto the Duranensis and Ipaensis pseudomolecules. And uh, so we designed some plots, some random plots of these sequences. So if we have, which is the expected model of A and B in the same dosage, we get a plot like this because we have the normalized density A and B equals one. But if we have something that deviates, uh, that deviates from this model, again, the plots are going to be different. So if you have four of B, then the density goes higher and the A goes lower. So this is a very simple plot that um, I'm going to show you the, the ones in real life now. So we sequence about 40 genotypes. I'm not going to show this here. I'm going to show one genotype and three linkage groups. This is a linkage group one. What we see is most of it is one. So we see along with the most of the uh, linkage group, you see a s the same dosage for A and for B. There's some small deletions or maybe gene conversion, something we, we still don't know what they are, but we can see small variation along the chromosome. Linkage group four is a totally different thing. This linkage group four is, it harbors lots of um, RGAs, lots of resistant genes. It's, um, they are highly collinear. The A and the B linkage, uh, chromosome fours are highly collinear. And we see here at the end, low dosage for A, then low dosage for B, then for A again. So there has been a lot of recombination going on there between the two genomes. And we see a similar thing in linkage group five, so in which we see about six million base pairs of terosomic recombination. So we're starting to analyze this data, but we already see a lot of very interesting information. And also they vary between different cultivars. Since we are looking at different um, botanical varieties, we start to see some trends for the different varieties and we also see some trends for Arrakis monticula, which is the uh, wild tetraploid peanut. So we're beginning to think that this, you know, this, this issue is quite large, it's larger than we expected. So I don't know if you're happy or sad about it, but it's something completely unexpected and, and quite interesting. And again, that's something that we're beginning to touch now. What are the effects of tetrapoidization on gene expression? Again, a few of you here are very familiar with the whole concept or of differences in gene expression when you have genome merger, when you have tetrapoidization, et cetera. But it's something that we are just beginning to investigate. And we have a very, very nice uh, model for it because we have the two progenitors of peanut, 
Aragazipines and Dorenensis. Uh, recently, we created new diploid hybrids, so we are able to look at the diploid hybrid before we weren't able to, because we thought the diploid hybrid didn't mean anything, we threw them away. Obviously, they're different plants, difficult plants to keep because you ha you, they don't produce seeds, so you have to keep them um, vegetatively, so not often are you able to do that. So now with the new, you know, knowing a bit more about it, we look at these plants in a, with a different light. We have new synthetic allotetraploids because before we thought they were completely stable. Now we are not so sure. We have uh, synthetic allotetraploid 10th generation, so we can see roughly what happened along all these rounds of selfing. We also have Arachis monticula, which is the one species of peanut, of wild peanut, which is tetraploid, and is probably a feral species of a feral relative of peanut. And it could be what peanut looked like thousands of years ago. And then we have peanut. So we have a very nice model to work with. So we did RNA seq of leaves, mapped on again onto the duranensis and epiensis pseudomolecules. And you know, these plots that I'm gonna show what I made them on Saturday. So it's completely out of the oven, completely new. So we're still trying to understand what's going on. Um, this is the genome, so linkage group one, again, one of the peanut cultivars, not much going on here. I don't know if you can see the new deployed hybrid. <coughs> Complete B dominance. Okay. And then what happens when the tetraploid dies, then you have a very good A and B balance. So. We may need to saturate this data a bit and you know, do some more tweaking, but it's quite clear here that you know, something really dramatic is happening between the stage of diploidization to the tetraploidization. This is the 10th generation. These are different synthetic to these. It's the same parentals, but done at different times. And the 10th generation, we don't see much dominance at all. These are Arachis monticular, which is a wild species of peanut and peanut. So, you know, we can have a look at domestication. Something happened here, but not much. So possibly they were very unstable in the first generations, and then later on, um, you know, there's a complete balance of the two subgenomes. Have you look, look at linkage group four, in which you have a lot of tritosomic recombination here at the ends? Again, linkage group four, the new deployed hybrid. Again, complete, well, not complete, but a very good B dominance. Again, uh, when it's tetraploidized, there is A B balance. Now, look at the 10th generation. Okay, this doesn't come here, okay? It's not a direct thing, because this is from a different cross. But what you can see is this this plant that we've had for ten, gener ten generations look very stable, looks completely the same as ten years ago. When you look at the linkage group four, you see complete A dominance. Well, almost complete A dominance. But not quite. So, but that's not because uh, this is not a, you know, a gene expression um, thing. It's that this is genomic. So we, we had some work before that that we looked at there's complete tetrasomic recombination here. So this is more a genomic event. And uh, looking at Arachis monticula, you see at the ends the same signature of tetrasomic recombination we see in Arachis monticula. And we also saw the same, very similar signature in peanut. So clearly these are very preliminary results but we are beginning to unravel very interesting factors here. I mean, we, some things have seem to be very stable ab along the thousands of years, and uh, you see a lot of um, great instability in the first generations. So there's a lot more work to be done, but it's, you know, it's something we are very excited about. So going through the <laughs> sorrows and joys and surprises, the first sorrow is 
peanuts and allotetraploid with very low genetic diversity and very poor disease resistance. So I've been crying like my son with his foot stuck on, his, you know, on the bench because <laughs> we felt completely stuck for a number of years, but having to go forward and, and you know, get along with it. So the prickly part is peanut, peanut has a more complex genetics than we expected before. So it's quite prickly, it's a surprise, but again, it's something we can deal with. And uh, you know, we're having a lot of success in improving disease resistance with wild alleles. Now with the new genome sequence, we can you know, go much faster and it's much, much better, much nicer to work with than previously. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you. And um, I want to acknowledge the funders of this research and, uh, and the group I've been working with. This is uh, my colleague, partner, and husband that we've been working with for the last 15 years on this, on this research. It's been you know, a great joy to work with, David Bertioli. These are my, is the core. I mean, there's many more people than these, students, postdocs, but this is the core group in Brazil. And I'd like, like to point to Zé Valls, who's the, uh, the one who's been collecting and organizing the German plasma banks, and he's a, you know, a great asset to to have. And this is the wonderful group of being we having the pleasure to work with here in the US. And I'd like to point out Scott Jackson, who's our host and friend. And again, we've been having great joy working with. And thank you very much. Well, I'll ask you one, for starters. Have you made any auto techniques? No, we have not. No, we have not. I was just wondering if you made yeah. those, whether you would get some of the same uh, qualities and then cross those to make your Yes. Your yeah. There have been some, exper some crazy experiments we thought about, and we like making octoploid, all octoploid. So that's, that would be some things that we thought of doing. But because we are very much interested in application, and you know, all the crosses we make, we are looking at the science behind it, but we are always looking at if we can get some product at the end of the line from them. I was just yeah. thinking specifically about the issue of the variability uh, between diploids and the tetrafluid states. So uh -huh. If you made the tetrafluids first, could you then assess for disease resistance or other qualities and then... Right, okay, so duplicate the two diploids first, and then yeah, cross and them, then yes. Yeah, yeah, could have, yeah. On the topic of you mentioned that, you know, on occasion, like one of your progenitor species, your progenitor species, it's for the disease you've been screening and ventricular resistance loci, are you finding that those are like specifically for aflatoxin or just, I mean, are you finding that there are really effective large effects loci, are you finding that there are a lot of genes in progenitor species that are captured, or are you finding that that is more about many different loci that they've got specific gender and more of them. Right, great, yes. Yeah, well, obviously, is, a, is something that is interests a lot of people from different crops as well. Um, our group, we haven't done work directly with aflatoxin ourselves. Um, what we've done is we created some uh, tetraploids, and in collaboration with Senegal, they've been looking at They've been, done, been doing field trials for diseases, and they've been assessing aflatoxin. And I think what they're finding is uh, that some of these, um, I think they are in BC, they have, they have um, segmental lines, they have some advanced lines. A lot of the lines are more, more resistant than the recurrent parent. Um, but they find they're very s they small, um, the additive effect, and they, are, they, they don't have anything of major effect. Everything is additive and um, of small effect. Do the organeller genomes play any role either in the success of the crosses or the behavior of the allopolis? Yeah, it's something we haven't looked at. No, we haven't looked at. Yes. 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 
it's something that is, is puzzling because it's, I think it, it evolved independently in other two taxa in, in legumes, but they're not necessarily related to, to Arrakis at all. So Vignus subterranean is one of them and it's far away. And all the Arrakis species have um, subterranean fruits. Yeah. So uh, looking at the transcriptome data, like, uh, I know it's fresh out of the oven, but if you uh, correct for the uh, genomic allele dosage, do you find any residual expression control that's classed uh, for one of the other? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So obviously what we're showing here were two different things in one. One was the genetic side of it, the other was the, the expression. So we haven't corrected that yet. So that's, that's one of the next steps to do, absolutely. Yeah. No, no. There isn't any Arrakis <coughs> species that is haploid that we know. So we've been working, and all the species that are in the um, Arrakis section that we work with that are crossable are deployed. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.